bear with me. I'm running just a little bit uh, slow here. I want to make one or two other points. <clears throat> I believe that the man who wrote the book did right. The man, I mean in the sense that he did not do wrong in publishing a book on Bible teaching through a human organization and having it circulated by a human organization. I think that was right. I think it's utterly inconsistent for him to oppose Florida College doing the same thing. He is just as inconsistent as a human being can be. Then the man who goes out and sells dicks and Bibles to people operate through a human organization and he always can give them a good sales speech. That'll help them to know more about the Bible and they'll be better Christians and all this sort of thing. And yet a post Florida college is about as inconsistent as a man can get. They're the same thing in principle. And uh, we had Brother Bobby Orr down at SFA, Stephen F. Austin State College, religious emphasis week to speak three nights or three days to the students of that college. He did a wonderful job and a lot of good. And I believe he glorified God in what he did. But the school down there paid him for coming down there. Now did Brother Owen commit a sin to go there and did that school do wrong uh, in uh, having Brother Owen to come? Or you may have some civil objections in some way or another to a thing of this kind, but at the same time, this was the arrangement. Roy Cogdell's here in the audience. Roy and I have both done the same thing. Doesn't make it right because we did it, but a lot of other preachers have to. When I lived at Terrell, Texas, and when Roy lived at Terrell, Texas, they had a state institution there, a state mental institution, and they did not have a, a chaplain there on the grounds of the institution. And so they had this arrangement. They asked six of the religious bodies of the community, excluding some that would excite the patients in one thing and another, to have... Uh, <laughs> they just got those that could make those folks understand. <laughs> anyway, uh, Roy Cogdell and I lived and preached at different times for the same church. But they allowed that they invited these churches to have their preachers come, preach every Sunday afternoon, two months out of the year, to these people. The state of Texas paid us for our services in doing this. I went out there and did this for the period of time that I lived in Terrell, Texas. I'd do it again. I believe it's perfectly scriptural. I don't believe there's a man alive that can prove it isn't. And yet, here's a human organization, the government even. Uh, and the end result here is that people are taught as much as they were able to. At a time, those people were just as rational as you and I. They, some of them were university graduates, and at times they would be just as rational as we are. And I felt that I was providing a needed service for these people, yet I was employed and paid by a human organization to do this thing. Now. Brethren, when you begin to find arguments against Florida College or to prove that it's unscriptural and hasn't the right to exist, you better begin to get ready to get away, do away with a lot of other things. This is the thing I'm trying to tell you. I'm not trying to prove that one thing is right by another. I'm saying that all of these things are right and on the same basis. They're scripturally permissible as service organizations. These are matters in the realm of Christian liberty. They have nothing to do with what a church may or may not do. They are not mandatory but permissible. Opposers who press these matters to the point of endangering or destroying fellowship between Christians are guilty of making laws where God did not make them and are correctly indicted with the sin of presumption. We shall deal with the opposers in our lesson tomorrow. Thank you. Now, you can quit worrying about your dinner after I presented all this, these cliches and sophistry. You'll have indigestion so bad you won't want to eat anyway.
Briefly today, I want to go over the positive material that has been presented the past two days. This will be extremely brief, but uh, I believe that this is certainly uh, in order. And uh, so we shall point out to you the basement. I believe we have the wrong chart up there, Brother Joseph. Yes, uh, give me uh, give me first my affirmation number uh, this one. Yes, and this is a recapitulation of a thing I developed at great length. This indicates what I am affirming in these studies. We affirm only the right of individual Christians. Now, not the obligation, but the right of individual Christians alone or in conjunction with others to own, build, operate, and are subsidized. That means make contributions to it. Such service organizations, please note that, as have been set forth, and these will be set forth again, in our remarks and charts, and the right of Christians and churches of Christ to patronize them on the basis of paying for services rendered. This is our proposition. And I have a qualifying statement because I knew that there were, would be brethren listening, especially those who are not uh, sympathetic with the position that I'm taking, who would immediately run off to uh, conclusions and uh, make statements that uh, would prejudice the point made and therefore the qualifying statement. This statement is to be qualified only by the understanding that services rendered are such services as a Christian or Church of Christ has the ethical and scriptural right to purchase. Now I mentioned later a number of service organizations. Some of these have services that are particularly available to individuals. Some of these have services that may be purchased by churches. Uh, I am dealing in this series of studies actually with the right of the individual. Church is not uh, involved in this. What I had to say about the church was purely gratuitous in so far as my particular obligation in this study is concerned. I cannot at great length go into some facet relative to what particular service a church might purchase or not purchase in a discussion of this kind. Now, if I had a week to do this in, we might thrash out all of those points. Whether we agreed on them or not, we could talk about them. But and this is the thing I want to get before you. Now, if you'll give me chart number one, please. This is the basis. Now, we are, I'm trying to prove here that Human service organizations are divinely authorized. We accept as our authority the Word of God. And we pointed out that things in the Bible, organizations even, are explicitly authorized. The family is explicitly authorized. Civil government is explicitly authorized. And I believe the local congregation, and I believe what Brother Cogdell said about it yesterday, that it's an organic, functional entity, that it is explicitly authorized in the New Testament. And then we pointed out that some things are not explicitly, that is in so many words, authorized, but they are implicitly authorized that they are implied in something that the scriptures have to say. I pointed out that these are of two kinds, requisite uh, and permitted. We illustrated this, that uh, sometimes a, a command uh, has a thing necessarily implied in it. The command to assemble necessarily implies the place of assembly. But then there are some things, and sing, sing necessarily implies pitch. You cannot sing without pitch. Pitch, 
some means of obtaining the pitch necessarily in, is implied in the, the command to sing. Well, we understand this. These arguments have been made many times. But there is another realm here, the realm of things permitted. Some things we said we have obligation to do, other things we have the right to do. We're not obligated to do them, but we have the right to do them. This is the realm of things permitted. This is the realm of Christian liberty. This is the realm of expediency. This is the realm of human judgment in religion. We could go back to our original uh, illustrations. A symbol implies a place of a symbol, but it does not imply the for necessarily the particular kind of place. We might have a rented hall. We might own a church building. We might meet in somebody's living room. We might meet under a tree or in a tent. Seeing implies the means of obtaining the pitch but not any particular means. Some people can memorize. They have a perfect memory for pitch. They memorize the pitch. And some work from middle C. They memorize middle C. Uh, others have a tuning fork or uh, some other sort of device of this kind to obtain the pitch. This is the realm of the permitted. We might do it any one of those ways and all of these ways are authorized in the sense of being permitted, permitted by divine authority. Now, I hope you understand that. Then we have, under permitted, we have two types of things here. The service organization that we're talking about. Of course, you understand that I am contending that service organizations belong in the realm of things permitted. Things permitted. And uh, they are not requisite, but they are permitted. And uh, <clears throat> there are two kinds of those. There are those, the end result of which, are not the same as that which a church may do at all. They have to do with other things. We were talking about a man earning a living for his family, that he might uh, work through General Motors Corporation, that he might uh, form a company and open a TV repair uh, shop and uh, many other ways he might do this. This is permitted, it's authorized by God. These organizations are that he may utilize in this regard. And then the second, organizations, the end result of which are also the end result of that which a church itself may do, is permitted to do. That's what we're talking about. Now here is our rule. Anything whatsoever which does not violate any other principle of divine truth and which, number one, is essential to the performance of, that's the requisite over here. Number two, are which serves to expedite the accomplishment of, this is the permitted, that which God requires of man though not explicitly designated, is implicitly authorized by the Word of God. Now, I'll stand on that rule. I don't believe anybody can overthrow that particular rule of interpretation. That's right. And uh, we'll proceed now from that point to my next chart. <clears throat> Here we have these service organizations. And I have put them in categories, and I said this yesterday. Now, somebody's going to come up and want to mix up these categories. I have put them in categories. I did that deliberately. Now, these categories may not be quite as precise, and you might think, well, now one of those might have been in another one. But I tried as best I could to keep them in the same category. I know in logic that you have to talk about things that belong in the same category. You're going to make sensible arguments. And so we have these things in categories. Up here yesterday, I put the Payton Construction Company, or when I made this chart several days ago, I did. I think I knew about another such arrangement as this at the time, but I, it had slipped my mind. 
Brother Elza Jerry in, in Louisville, Kentucky, operates very much the same sort of service or churches of Christ that the Payton Construction Company does. And he does this for brethren who are conservative. He's a faithful, loyal member of the Lord's Church. I understand that he's here in this audience, or rather he's on the campus at least, and he may be in the audience today. But he operates this uh, organization, human in character, but he provides a service that churches of Christ purchase from him in providing for themselves a place to assemble and to edify and to evangelize. We mentioned the Fort Worth, Texas Loan Company, travel agency, radio stations, uh, particularly for the purpose of having religious programs, nursing homes, hospitals, home for the aged, children's homes. Now these in the third category of benevolence. Number two helps us to go into all the world, preach the word, and teach. This over here helps us to visit the fatherless and widows and remember the poor and go take care of those that are sick. Come unto them as the Lord said. Helps the church to take care of widows indeed. Uh, and helps a man to provide for his own. That uh, could help churches or individuals in the matter of their individual responsibilities in benevolence or churches in their responsibilities in the field of benevolence. And uh, as long as these are on the basis of payment for services rendered, I will endorse them, I will contribute to them. If our brethren would put their homes for the aged and the orphan homes on this basis, I'd start contributing to everyone I'm able to contribute to tomorrow. That would settle this whole proposition as far as I'm concerned. Now, Gail Oler talks about their being on that basis. He says that's the basis both homes are, but he misrepresents the matter. That's not the basis on which Bowles Home exists. And though this is a thing that the church itself may also do, yet if this organization existed as a service organization, the church could fulfill its responsibilities by provide or by paying these people for rendering this service of care to these people or visiting them or whatever the New Testament requires us to do with reference to them. An individual could utilize them. A church could utilize them. And I would support them and I would contribute to them. And the fact that I, they're a non-profit and I contributed to them wouldn't change their character as a service organization in the least. Not in the least. And the same thing is true of Anico Publications, Gospel Guardian, Preceptor Company. These are conducted by Christians. Now the John A. Dixon Company is not a company owned by Christians. We go to contributing things as to things as Christians. This, of course, would be a consideration. I'm not, uh, I do not have the time to go into that particular aspect today. These are side issues. This is not the real issue. And I'm trying to stay with that in this discussion, which is the issue in this thing, the basic proposition that we're confronted with. Now down here in this realm, we have the public schools. We have summer camps. Uh, we have Florida College and other colleges. We have Sabinel, Texas, Music Normal, where people are trained to be song directors and serve the Lord and the Lord's people in the work of the church. But this is a human organization, and people attend it, and they, they are paid for the services that they render. A church might send a young man to this and pay uh, for his teaching that he received there in order that he might come home and be a better song leader for the Lord's people. Now, some of you may disagree with that point. I, that is immaterial to me, but I believe it can be sustained. Even a church, reminding you that is not the issue in this discussion. This is purely gratuitous. That's the thing I'm trying to say. Hence, I'm not going to argue that particular point at any length at all. The end result is that song directors are trained, preachers are trained, people are edified, people are evangelized. I pointed out I put Harvard Divinity School down here because the amusing thing is that some of the outstanding anti-college men have gone to these sectarian infidel seminaries in the north 
to get their uh, advanced education in Bible, obtain many uh, divinity degrees or, uh, uh, from these institutions to better equip them, they think, to do what they've given their life to. And yet they say if the, ser if the Lord's people should provide a service, Bible-believing people, uh, Bible-loving people, God-fearing people, uh, God-honoring people, if they would do this, it would be a sin against God for them to do it. Now, that kind of logic, if you can swallow that, you need to have indigestion. You need to have it. You ought to have a big stomach in if you can swallow that kind of stuff. That's the most ridiculous logic that I have ever heard in my life. And Leroy Garrett, in his debate several years with Brother Humble, kept re refused to deal with that point. Well, he was so guilty, that's the reason. He wouldn't deal with that point. Or oh, I'll debate you some other time. And maybe you don't know what my position is about that, but yet, I think at that time, I think I'm correct. He had not at that time yet received his, doc his PhD. Now, he had received a number of other degrees, about four or five of them. <coughs> Master of Systematic Theology from two different ones, but he had not yet been awarded his doctor's degree from the Harvard Divinity School, or whichever school it was that he was getting it from, but uh, he evaded this point with Brother Humble. He wouldn't deal with it. I don't blame him. I wouldn't deal with it either. As I said, that'll give you a big stomachache and a headache too when you try to deal with a thing like that. Now, we mentioned yesterday the Bible Society. And I just use that term society there as an accommodating expression to describe an organization which exists for the purpose of translating the scriptures, of publishing the translation, and of circulating it among people of the world. I pointed out to you that here is a thing that is the purest form of Bible teaching. Brethren just want to harp about some human organization doing Bible teaching. There isn't any purer form than Bible teaching uh, in, Bi in the realm of Bible teaching, any pure form of Bible teaching. Put it that way. There is no purer form of Bible teaching than the teaching of the Bible itself. And if you think there is, you're rather egotistic. When you think your purely human comments have more sanctity than what the Word of God says itself, then uh, there's something wrong with your thinking apparatus. Because this is the purest form of Bible teaching. And the argument, the argument that brethren make with reference to organizations such as Florida College would preclude the possibility of an organization existing in the world for the purpose of translating, bringing out a pure translation, publishing it, and circulating it among people who are interested in divine things. This obviously couldn't be done by one individual. Anytime one individual translates the Bible, it will not be accepted. I don't care how good it is, it's ridiculous to suppose that it will affect anything much. A few students will take it. If it's a good one, they'll study it and refer to it, and it might be of some benefit. But no private translation will ever be accepted by the world generally. And anybody ought to know better uh, than to think that it would. It will not. It will not be accepted. And uh, this is no reflection on the trans man doing the translating or anything of the kind. But the point I make, no single individual could do this thing. No single individual could do it. And uh, publishing and circulating, selling books is not the work of the church, these same brethren would say. They would rise up in holy horror if one should suggest that the church should begin to sell Bibles. However pure the translation might be, and yet they say a human organization can exist to do this. Well, who on earth is going to do it then? The devil's crap. Turn this over to the devil. Let him take care of it. 
we have created a, a situation here by what we think is logic and argumentation. Actually, it's a lot of roundabout reasoning without very much logic in it. We arrive at a conclusion that precludes the possibility of this being done by the people of God. And if there were no other argument against this position, this would be enough for me. This is enough. Now, this is how I justify Florida College. It is a service institution. Now, I'm going to leave that right up there. You just look at it all the time. And we'll go on here with our lessons today. We have a number of organizations up here. In this final lesson, I'm going to be controverting the critics of colleges such as Florida College. Actually, Florida College is about the only thing that comes under any uh, objection from conservative brethren in this realm. They accept all the rest of it. They accept all of the rest of it, but they object to a college. That's just as inconsistent as a thing can be. But yet, that's the position that they occupy. They take all the rest of it, but they object to Florida College. I'm not trying to prove one thing right by another. Don't you go away from here and say I did. Because I haven't done that, and you know I haven't done that. I believe all of these things are scripture, and I justify all of them on the same basis, scripturally and logically. Now these differ in some respects, but they do have one thing in common, or two things in common. They are all service institutions provided to serve individuals and churches. They have that in common. They have one other thing in common. The end result of what they do are the end result of things that the church itself as a church may do. The end result. We have the end result over that. Now these things they do have in common. They exist in different categories to show you that they do not have some things in common. But they all have these things in common, and they all are human service organizations designed to serve individuals and churches. Not every one of them individuals and churches necessarily, but either all, and sometimes both, now let's go on with our discussion. I want to describe our opposition just a little bit here. The persons. Now the men, I'm talking about the men now among conservative brethren. This is what I'm talking about. That uh, are having something to say along this line. For the most part, as to character, they are men of unquestioned integrity. Now nothing I say up here is intended as any reflection upon the character of these men. Some of them are my very close personal friends. I love and respect them. And uh, this is no reflection upon their integrity or their character or their ability as far as that's concerned or for the most part their standing among the brethren. None of these things are in question here today. So don't go off and Tell somebody that I jumped on somebody and got vicious in my description of him and that sort of thing. This won't help your situation any. As to argumentation, now this is a different matter. This is determined, that is the value, and this is no reflection on their intelligence. I'm dealing with their argumentation as I view it. And as far as I am concerned, this is the thing that determines the weight of their criticism. That they're good men doesn't add anything to the fact of what they have to say against Florida College. Uh, that they have standing among the brethren, that doesn't have anything to do with uh, the validity of what they may say. That they're honest men and able men, that doesn't have anything to do with it. But the weight of the criticism itself, this is the thing that we're concerned about. I, in preparation for this, uh, these speeches, I read two debates of years past where critics 
were outstanding representatives of the anti-college position. Carl Ketcherside and Leroy Garrett, I don't believe there are two men in the United States today that can better represent this position than these two men. I read the debate between Wallace and Ketcherside. I read the debate between Garrett and Humble. Again, I've read it before, but I carefully read it again. I listened to four or five or six or seven hours of tape recordings by an outstanding conservative man who was speaking on his concept of the church and the individual and other related matters. Of course, the conclusion that he reaches concerning these matters would preclude the scriptural existence of a school like Florida College. Therefore, I read, I listened to these, I've heard them before, but on my tape recorder, I played them very carefully. Stopped them, listened, played them over, went back over all of this material very carefully again. Then I read a book. I had read this book in manuscript and had talked to this man at great length, and I've referred to this book before. I had read the book in manuscript and written him my criticisms of his position. We had talked until the wee hours of the morning about this thing in a mutual friend's house, and uh, I love the man, he's a good man. Of course, I disagree with his position. And uh, I read his book, and he's a man of ability and character among conservative brethren. He's reviewing Bible departments. All of this idea in uh, making preparation for these speeches. This I want to say. I make this statement advisedly, but I believe it, as far as I'm concerned, it's true. That their opposition is literally a slew of sophistry and semantical manipulation. The worst that I have ever seen on any subject that I have studied in more than 34 years of gospel preaching. I have prepared for debates. I have prepared to moderate in debates, to help others in debates written many articles on many subjects which I've done research, but in all of the research that I've done on any question, in all of the years that I've been preaching, I have met, never met as much pure sophistry and semantical manipulation as I found in these debates and these books and these sermons. This to me was rather interesting. Uh, the propagandist approach is used almost invariably. Sort of approach that is utilized by advertising agencies on TV and radio and the newspaper and billboards. The use of a lot of loaded terminology, comparable in court, to a lawyer on direct examination asking leading questions. Now the court will not allow this unless the witness be qualified as a hostile witness. That's the only way it can be done. The courts do not allow it because it is highly prejudicial and therefore it has been banned from the courts. This kind of examination cannot be done without qualifying the witness as hostile. Uh, this is loaded. It's loaded. It's leading. It leads to a conclusion and the conclusion is the conclusion of the law and not the conclusion or not the thing that the witness is testifying to. The courts ban this sort of thing, and rightly so. But this is the approach that all of these men make in debating on it, in speaking on it, in writing on it. The propagandist approach to the subject. Uh, and uh, so we're going to take up some of this propaganda material here today. They tell us, quote, there is only one box. They say, quote, Show me the scripture that authorizes another box. That sounds good, doesn't it? No one claims that the school is the body of Christ, nor does it profess to be a body of Christ in the New Testament sense of that expression. Now, differing human denominations professing to be churches of Christ would constitute other bodies. A Masonic lodge might holding forth to its members the hope of heaven in that particular body. A Masonic Lodge 
might qualify as that kind of a bottle. Some of our men who are plowing new ground in their estimation relative to the absolute non-organic character of Christianity and who in the development of this theory deny that the church of God and the spiritual kingdom of Christ are one and the same thing might be guilty of bringing into existence another body, two bodies. Brother Cogswell made this point yesterday, and it's a very valid point. <clears throat> now, I could oppose, I could oppose a publishing house or a nursing home providing services for a church to accomplish its mission or individuals to accomplish theirs as individual Christians. I could refer to it as, and, or them as other bodies. The same logic that would make Florida College another body would make these another body. And this is the point I tried to get over to you on this chart up here. So you just keep looking at it. Now they say, I believe the church is all sufficient. So do I, and so do others who support the colleges. They say this, quote, if it helps the church to grow, and this is quotation from the book, if it helps the church to grow, the church is not all sufficient. I never read a sillier statement in my life, and I say this as kindly as I know how. If it helps the church to grow. Now you just think about that. The fact that we live in the land of the free and the home of the brave helps the church of God in America to grow. Does that mean that the church is not all sufficient? The fact that this city has laws and regulations uh, that uh, are are kind to and are directed in to help the existence of churches of Christ in this city. This helps the church to grow in this city. Does this mean that the church is not all sufficient? Free public education in this country where people can learn to read and to think intelligently so that they can take their Bibles and read and reflect upon it and learn the truth for themselves. The public schools help the church to grow. Does this mean that the church is not all sufficient? Now, brethren, you think about that. An objection of that kind by an intelligent man put out before an intelligent brotherhood with the idea uh, of uh, producing uh, perhaps a cleavage or with the possibility of a cleavage. I would not say the motivation thing. I don't mean to imply that. But I would say that there is inherent in this sort of thing the possibility of a developing cleavage among the people of God and to put a thing out and sustain it by statements of that kind. You just imagine a thing like this. All sufficient for what, we ask. I say that the church, that a local church, we're going to talk about this mixing up of the church universal and local here in just a minute. They do this all the time and cry about other folks do. That's the peculiar thing. <clears throat> the church is all sufficient, or a church of Christ, is all sufficient to do everything that God ordained that that church should do as a church. I believe that. I believe that. That's what I've been arguing with my liberal brethren all these years. For the many years past, I believe that. God did not command a local congregation to become a college, an institution specializing in higher education. God did not require further all teaching of the Word of God or exerting of saving influence to be done through the organic structure of a local congregation. Now, if he did, I'm like Brother Puckett, and I endorse what Brother Puckett said on the Holy Spirit. This speaks today. I endorse 100%. Now, the, the thing I want you to see here is this. Where is the passage that says it? Where is it that says it? 
these brethren are always talking along this line. They may not say this is so, but this is what their argument implies. And this is a point they would have to establish to establish their thesis in the map. And they don't have Scripture 1 that even begins to hint or to look like it meant to say anything of the kind. It just isn't in the Word of God. This isn't so. This is not the truth. Now let me give you an example or two. Paul taught the truth and exerted saving influence through the organic structure of the Roman government, both at Caesarea and at Rome. He was housed and fed, and the situation in which he preached provided for him by the Roman government. Now you say, oh, well, he was a prisoner. He was a prisoner. That's neither here nor there. He could have made a civil defense of himself, but he preached the gospel. He utilized, they, they fed him, they housed him. You say it was against his will. That doesn't make any difference. He was being fed and housed, and he operated through a situation provided for him by a human organization, a heathen government. Through this, he preached the gospel of Jesus Christ. And then again, Paul taught the truth and exerted saving influence through the organic structure of the school of Tyrannus in Acts 19 and 9. Now, I don't know what kind of school this was, neither do scholars. Some say it was a private rabbinical school. Others say that it was a school of Greek philosophy. I am inclined to the view that it was a school of Greek philosophy. I doubt that it was a rabbinical school. He'd been excluded from the synagogue. Why should a person operating a private rabbinical school offer him the opportunity of operating in this fashion? But the point I'm trying to make, that's neither here nor there. The point I'm trying to make is that he did teach the word of God, that he did preach, that he did operate through the organic structure, whatever it was. I don't know what the organic structure of this thing was. But it had the existence and reality and it functioned. It had some sort of organic structure. And whatever it was, Paul utilized the facilities, he utilized the organic structure of this organization through which to function in preaching and teaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. And uh, I take it that that would be an approved uh, example. Well, some of them comes along and says, but now the school of Tyrannus is not exactly the same as Florida College. I didn't say it was. I'm not arguing that Paul's relationship to the school of Tyrannus was an exact counterpart, that is, in every particular. I'm saying it only illustrates the point made that he did teach through the organic structure of a human organization. He did this. This he did. And this is the point that we are talking about. What it involved, we do not know. I know it involved agreement between them. I don't know whether he asked Paul to do it or whether Paul approached him and had the opportunity to do it. I know that they reached an agreement. I know that we had students here who were either studying Jewish philosophy or Greek philosophy and that Paul taught these uh, people in the school situation and uh, they, he taught them with some sort of an arrangement here. Whether Tyrannus gave him anything for doing it or not, it isn't said. Uh, that's, that's not the point of issue. He did operate through the organic structure of the school of Tyrannus to do this thing, whatever it was. And this is the basic point uh, involved. This we need to recognize. Brother Cogdell and I did that at Terrell in the middle institution. Brother Owen did that at Stephen F. Austin State College while a religious emphasis week. People do this sort of thing all the time, brethren. Now, let's go on. The next statement they made, quote, the local congregation, the only organized means the Lord has provided for the doing of our, now you imagine, a man writing about denominational trends among the brethren, talking about our cooperative work. I find some brethren using the expression our brotherhood. I see it in a lot of the conservative brethren's papers. 
Brother Gail Olders, always using this expression, our brethren, I was shocked to the very bottom of my feet, considering my long, close acquaintance with Brother Foy Wallace Jr. To read in one of his books recently this expression, our brotherhood. This is as sectarian as a thing can be. It's denominational in its import. When we go to talk, now the brotherhood is one thing, but when we begin to talk about our brotherhood, when we get this our business in here, we're becoming sectarian and denominational in our attitude. We need to avoid it. Of course, I think brethren sometimes just uh, don't intend that, but they use that kind of language. We presume our here means Christian. But what is our cooperative work? He said in his kingdom. Christians are in the Lord's kingdom at all times. Everything a Christian does is done in this relationship. I'm not saying everything that the individual does, the church does. That's not the point. But I'm thinking that everything a Christian does in any realm of life, he does it in the kingdom. He's in the kingdom. He's in the relationship with Christ that is suggested by this statement. All right. No one argues that colleges are to assume the work of congregations. If so, it would displace them in the areas where they exist. I ask you, has Florida College displaced any congregations in any sense in this area? I think you know better than that. Now, let's go on. What, this quote again, what work is the congregation, this is the question, I believe, what work is the congregation authorized to do which it has no right to share with another organization? The congregation shares none of her work with any other organization. The existence of a college in Temple Terrace does not relieve the Temple Terrace congregation from any of its responsibilities to teach or otherwise work, nor does attendance at Florida College relieve any of its students from congregational responsibilities. And I think these students are always impressed with that by these teachers here in this school. And if I didn't think that was so, I wouldn't be up here making these speeches. If the writer means can another organization do some of the same things the church does? Or may a church hire a human organization to perform a service for her that she is at the same time <coughs> authorized by God in a permissive sense to provide for herself? Yes, indeed. And I've pointed out to you the numerous things. The church could build its own meeting house. Or it can get Brother Gary or the Payton Construction Company uh, to do it. And uh, these other matters are in the, the nursing home, things of this kind. Church could provide, as they did at Jerusalem, uh, in the church there, the taking care of those who were the just objects of the benevolence of the congregation. But on the other hand, they could go out here and pay for this service in a service institution, just as the man on the road from Jerusalem to Jericho took care of the man himself, and when he left him there, he wasn't well, so he hired the innkeeper to take care of him. Now, in both cases, he took care of the man. One time, he did it personally, the, the second time, he hired it to be done by a service institution. I hope you can see that. That isn't difficult to do. And uh, to see, I don't believe. That seems very clear to me. Now let's proceed. <clears throat> the family organization teaches worships. Note the denial as we previously mentioned, of the family as an organization. This is ridiculous. The family was uh, certainly recognized in patriarchy as an organization. The family was 
recognized under Judaism or under the law of Moses as an organization. The family, I could quote numerous passages to sustain this, is recognized as an organization under the rule of Christ. Civil law recognizes uh, the family as an organization. It has a head oversight. It has pooling of resources. It has a common treasury. It has community proper, property. In many things it acts as one. It can be legally incorporated. Many families are, if they have a particular need for legal incorporation. They can be incorporated at, at, under the law. And uh, so uh, they must have the attributes of an organization for these things to be so. These are the attributes of an organization. And uh, so the family is an organization. The top publishing companies provide a teaching service which is utilized by the churches. The nursing home provides a service that a church may do herself and so on. We've mentioned that. The college provides a teaching service which may be purchased by those needing it and desiring it. And then we mentioned yesterday this point, on what basis could one deny the college the right to engage Homer Haley to teach minor prophets in the classroom and sell this service and uh, <coughs> then uh, permit a publishing company at the same time to uh, hire Homer Haley to write a book on minor prophets and circulate and sell this teaching service, the very same material, accept the one and deny the other. Brother Cope told me an interesting thing yesterday. The fact of the matter is, the college bookstore over here does that very thing. And some of these brethren who oppose would not hesitate to sit down and if they had a young preacher that they thought needed some instruction in the minor prophets, they would not uh, bat an eye about sending money to this human organization to provide Brother Haley's teaching to make this young man a better preacher, uh, but they oppose the existence of this school because it sells the same service in the classroom. It's the same organization they accept the one and reject the other. Now, brethren, if you can understand that kind of logic, you have a, a better thinker than I have. I just can't see through that kind of logic. It just doesn't add up. And I'd be willing to rest my case right now. I'd be willing to rest it, as far as that's concerned. But it's full. I'm a servant. Rob the church of her glory. How many times have you heard that? I hear that all the time. How is the word church used here? They don't tell you. Do they mean it robs the local church of her glory, or do they mean it robs the church universal of its glory? What are they talking about? They don't say it. They don't take the trouble to define what they're talking about. This is a cliche. This is a propaganda approach. Rob, that sounds good. Nobody wants to rob God's church of a glory. Certainly not. And so they say, rob the church of a glory. Well, let's suppose it means local. I'm not sure what they mean by glory here or glorifying God uh, through the church. You know, we've had done some fuzzy thinking on this based on Ephesians 3, uh, 21. He said, that we glorify God in the church by Christ Jesus throughout all ages, world without end. Of course we glorify God in the church, in this relationship to Christ. We glorify God. He doesn't say here that we're to glorify the local church. That's not what he says. And this is generally what they mean by their argument. You don't glorify the local church. Now I believe in the book an explanation is made that this isn't what he means. He means something else. I'm not sure I understand just what he did mean. Uh, but anyway, he said he didn't mean that. And so we'll not accuse him particularly of meaning that. A church glorifies God. Now let's get this. A church, a congregation, glorifies God when she fulfills her scriptural mission. She glorifies God. A Christian glorifies God 
in all of the relationships of life as he lives in harmony with the will of God. I don't care what organization he's in either. It can be a government relation, it can be a school relation, it can be a business relation, it can be a social relation, whatever it is. The Christian, as he lives in harmony with the will of God and reflects the influence of Christ living in him upon men, this man glorifies God. That's the reason I said yesterday that I believe a man could glorify God in a human organization. Certainly he can. And it's ridiculous to argue that he can. Certainly he can glorify God. They make a big thing out of that. How could you glorify God in a human organization? You can glorify God as an individual Christian in a human organization. Certainly so. If it's a proper relationship, God's glorified in it. Now, let me show you something here. We hear a lot of talk uh, along this line about things being humanitarian obligations. You know, I, there's some thinking needs to be done on this, and there's going to have to be some writing done on this thing that we talk about being a humanitarian obligation. No, I don't know anything but about one religion, and that's the religion of the Lord Jesus Christ. Christ rules the universe today. He sits on the throne at God's right hand. Judaism is no more. Patriarchy is no more. Heathen religion uh, is not bad. Any other form of religion. Only religion I know anything about uh, that is bad is this. And uh, when we get to talk about humanitarian obligations and things peculiar to a Christian, I'm going to have some more to say about that in a moment. We look overlook some things. Here in Ephesians, the sixth chapter, you will observe in the ver verses five, he said, Servants, be obedient to them that are your masters according to the flesh, with fear and trembling, and singles of your heart is unto Christ, not with eye service as men pleasers, but as the servants of Christ, doing the will of God from the heart, with good will doing service as to the Lord and not to men knowing that whatsoever good thing any man do, the same shall he receive of the Lord, whether he be bond or free. This is the point I'm making. What I do in civil government, I do it as a matter of conscience, not simply a humanitarian thing. What I do in relationship to my wife, I do it as a matter of conscience, involving the will of Jesus Christ. I do in my family relations these things as a matter of conscience. I do in my business relationship these things as a matter of conscience. There isn't anything that a Christian does that he doesn't, if he does it right, that he doesn't do in this sense. Now, we need to do a lot of thinking along this time, but I don't have time to explore this possibility. An organization to rob the church of her rightful place in God's great redemptive scheme by arrogating to herself prerogatives that belong only and exclusive to the local congregation as such, hence displacing her. Does selling a Bible course to a college student displace the church? Does selling a set of commentaries to a Bible student by a publishing company, a human organization, displace the church? No. Bible teaching in both instances, human organizations providing it, the church is not displaced. Does this aid the church? Does this help the church? Certainly it helps the church, as it helps this individual who exerts his influence in his church relationship in the local congregation. Certainly it helps the church as he lives right in the community and reflects uh, the glory of God as a result of what he's learned. Does this help the church universal? Yes, as he converts people to the Lord and as he gets the gospel before men. Certainly this helps the church. Who's foolish enough to deny that it helps the church? And who is foolish enough to say that this reflects on the all-sufficiency of the church? I don't believe a word of a statement of that kind. All right, quote, 
We do not believe that every young person should be pressured into going to college. College. Who said they should? Is this an issue, brethren? Now you know better. Why should a man bring up a thing like this? I warned you, brethren, about being exaggerated. This is what I'm talking about. See, here's what this man is getting at here. Somebody, somewhere, he's heard exaggerate the value of a college such as this. He takes this to mean that we're trying to pressure every young person on earth to go to college. Why, these men here know better than anybody else. They have to deal with these students. And they have certain requirements that these students have to meet. Education and otherwise, psychological and otherwise, to get into this school. They know that every student doesn't need to come to Florida College. They know that better than anybody. They're not trying to pressure every, every Christian child on earth or every child who is a Christian, every young person who is a Christian to come to Florida College. They know that many young people, they're fine, they're good, they're Christians, but they're not just subjects of a college education. They know that better than anybody. This is foolishness, brethren. And this is what is in this book, this sort of thing, about 90% of it. We do not believe any person should be influenced to go to a college out of a sense of religious obligation. Well, now here's another one of these same kind of things. Brethren might have been unwise somewhere at some time to put this kind of pressure. But it's wrong if we do. It's wrong now in, in, a, in a sense. If we knew a child well, suppose I have a child, I know this child well, I know the child is weak, sub, uh, subject to the wrong kind of influence, a uh, good child, member of the body, I've done my best to teach the child, but he has the disposition to be weak, to be influenced by the wrong kind of environment easily. And I know that if I put him in the right environment, he'll be all right. If I put him in the wrong environment, uh, he won't be all right. I do have a religious obligation here. And the child, if he had sense enough to make the choice, would also have a religious obligation in this regard. Now, in this sense, there could be a religious obligation. But nobody argues that everybody has a religious obligation to come to Florida College. This is utter foolishness. And it isn't so. This isn't what is taught. Or he says, quote, under the mistaken idea that his service to God, now note, note these propaganda words. He puts in here, he hedged, necessary depends. And he puts, in any manner whatsoever, on a college education. Well, let me talk about that in any manner whatsoever. We've had a lot of talk about translations. Suppose some young man early in life decides that he wants God's people to have a pure translation. And uh, he wants to do this service to God. He wants to give God's people the Bible in the purest translation possible. Now what's he going to do? How's he going to prepare himself to do this service to God? Is he going to do it digging ditches? Is he going to do it uh, <coughs> cultivating cotton? Is that the way he's going to prepare himself? Is that the way you prepare to translate the Bible? What do you do? You go to college. You learn the English language, you learn the German, and you learn French, perhaps, so that you can read old scholarly uh, works in other languages. You take uh, many, many years in Koine Greek and in Hebrew and in uh, other uh, Semitic languages in order that you might be qualified to perform this service to God. I would say that this service would necessarily depend on a college education. You couldn't perform this service without it. How could you? Now, brethren, we need to do a little thinking instead of listening to these cliches. We do not believe that a young person's faith, now note this, here's this propaganda word again, is necessarily enhanced by attending a college. Why didn't he just say, we do not believe a young person's faith is enhanced by attending a church-related, quote, church-related school. No, I put necessarily in there. Well, we wouldn't say necessarily. We would say that it, it could be enhanced by it. And uh, he says, or oh, that is necessarily, note there it is again, endangered by his attending a public school. Well, I don't know anybody that says that uh, 
in the sense perhaps that he's, he means it's necessarily endangered, but I'd ask this question. Would exposure, exposure to danger constitute being in danger? When I knowingly expose uh, a person to danger, would that be endangering that person? I live right close to a state school campus. We have a work that we do with the college students there. And I know something, my boys in this state school, I know something about the influences of a state school. And when anybody says that a child today, a Christian, is not exposed to danger, an impressionable youth is not exposed to danger, in putting him into a big infidel state university, he just doesn't know what he's talking about. Now, there ain't any use arguing this point. This is too self-evident even to argue about. So, uh, we need to think about this, brethren. Is my child infallible? Could he not be influenced in the wrong way? Therefore, could he not be exposed to danger in such an environment? I think you recognize that he could. Quote, we do not believe that the church of our Lord can be organically tied in any manner whatsoever to an educational society or department or any other kind of organic body. Neither do I. We strongly resist the idea, quote, that the church is in the secular school business or the secular school or the secular school in the church business. Well, we do not eat. Should I quit or should I finish? Take a moment. Take a moment to finish. Well, I have a whole lot here that I'm not going to be able to get to. I can see that already. Uh, he talks about it constituting a missionary society. Well, anybody that knows anything about a missionary society knows that a college and a missionary society are altogether two different things. The missionary society is an agency of the churches and controlled by delegates from the churches and such like. There's no comparison here. It doesn't have a setup like a college, not a service institution. Somebody wants to know if it could be a service institution. If it had a service, if it existed as a service organization, and it had a service, that it would be scriptural for the church to purchase, yes. If it were a travel agency, for instance, in getting visas and things, yes, they could purchase a service from an organization. But then it wouldn't be a missionary society. We have the ambiguity of terms that these people use, constantly using them, and this is what we meant by semantical uh, manipulation. They talk about church, they don't tell you whether it's local or the other. They talk about church related. Well, what does that mean? You know, the relationship, or whether it's wrong or not wrong, would depend upon the relationship which exists. There are all kinds of relationships, organic, psychological, spiritual, spiritual, economic, some proper, some improper. Let them identify what they mean by church-related spiritual work. And they started out saying, if it does a spiritual work, then they change to work uh, of faith. Then they change to thing of Christ. And now they talk about a thing peculiar to being a Christian. Well, let me give a resume of some miscellaneous charges, and we'll close here this morning. They talk about it, uh, Bible colleges leading away from God in all ages of the world. Well, so have congregations. So have congregations, and they're divinely authorized. They've led away from God. Show me a congregation that's very old that's standing for New Testament truth today. Show me one. Where are the seven churches of Asia today? The churches have led away from God in all ages of the world. Does that mean a church wrong? Anything human will can be, that has a human element, can be caused uh, to digress and lead people away from God. That's no argument. A preacher, a factory. Well, we could come back to the publishing house. They'll buy a book on homiletics and give to a young man. They'll buy a book on hermeneutics and give to a young man to make him a preacher. They'll buy him a set of commentaries and give it to a young man to make him a preacher. 
They'll buy him a book on Greek grammar and give it to a young man from a human organization provided by it. But they'll say, now, if these brethren down here sell a service like this, this is a missionary society or a non-scriptural organization. And they meet themselves coming back. This I cannot miss. I must say this. Compulsory chapel attendance. They make a great deal out of this. They talk about this as though this meant enforced worship. Children in this school are required to attend chapel or assembly. This does not mean they are forced to worship. That's up to them. They can worship or read their lesson for the next day. They're not required to worship. And this school states this over and over every year. They are required to come. They know that before they come. This is the rule of the school. They believe this affords an opportunity for maintaining the kind of an environment they want here. And they have a right to do this. A student is forced to attend, but he is not forced to participate in. All that he's required to do is to maintain all while it's going on and not infringe upon the liberties of others. Now, there's no such thing as enforced worship in this school, and anybody that says so is misrepresenting the school. I am in a college town. Suppose I had a group of college boys to come and room in my house. We had family worship in my house in the morning, and I would say to these boys when they came to room with me, now I make it a rule in my home that everybody who lives here must attend family worship. They must attend family worship because this creates an atmosphere that I want to maintain in my home. I do not say you may not believe like I do. You do not have to participate. But if you live in my home, you must come to family worship and you must be respectful. Would I have a right to do that? I know I would, brethren. And this school has the same right that I would have in this regard. Lectureship for gospel meetings. If I owned a factory, could I have men and come and speak to the employees? Could the Washington Manufacturing Company owned by Christians uh, do this? Could the Visitor Corporation owned by Christians do this? Could the American Founders Life Insurance Company at all of Austin, Texas owned by Christians do this? Yes, indeed. And they would not be infringing upon the church. Did the state of Texas sin against God when it had me to come to this mental institution and preach the gospel to these people? Then we come to the matter of state accreditation. I say, why not? We comply with the law in many other areas, trustees, exits, incorporation, building codes, parking restrictions, restrooms. These are pure objections, brethren. Preacher placement, that's another one. Preacher placement. Well, I place preachers all the time. And uh, these gospel papers place preachers all the time in the same sense that these brethren do. People write us and ask us and say, we need a preacher. Do you know a good sound preacher? These brethren write back and say, yes, I'd recommend so and so. I do the same thing. Publishing houses do the same thing. Brethren everywhere do this. Why well, bring this as an indictment against Florida College? Then this final statement and the lesson is over. The logic of the arguments of the critics make it impossible for Christians to operate a school on any basis. Bible teaching is only one aspect of this matter. Moral conduct is required and exemplified. Moral conduct required and exemplified on this campus is that ordained by Christ. This is essential to salvation in heaven. New Testament Bible truth is never contradicted in teaching of any other subject in the curriculum here. Hence, all teaching is governed by this general rule. The student's faith uh, could be wrecked in this regard uh, because well, you don't just wreck a student's faith in the Bible class. If you think that's so, then you haven't attended a state college. They do it in the English courses. They do it in the science courses. They do it in the education courses. They do it in the philosophy courses. They do it in the courses on history. Brethren, these brethren, when they teach history, teach history with the grand 
overruling law of Christ governing everything they say. And if they don't, they're wrong, of course, but I believe they do. That's the reason I believe in this truth. And here then, uh, this, if we took the Bible department out of this school, it wouldn't change the matter in the least because there would be Bible influence, there would be Bible teaching constantly being done here, the law of Christ permeating this whole thing because it's operated by Christians for Christians. And that's the way that it ought to be. Conduct, influence, discipline, everything done here is governed in that way. So your argument would simply mean not that we'd have to do away with the Bible department, but that we'd have to mean, it would have to mean simply that Christians can't operate a school. That's it. That's my lesson.